or add an asterisk on the call. Remove asterisk. Oh, I see. sorry. Okay. Oh, Geek Dude, I didn't, that's interesting. He says that um, objects given as parameters are always by ref. That's interesting. I never really thought about it. That is a very good thing to keep in mind. Um, my first draft of libraries usually have a, a couple globals simply because I haven't figured out a proper way to pass around it. Yeah, I hear you. Um, now, you know, one thing actually we didn't cover yet, and, and let me go ahead and... Um, no, I can talk through this. So y'all are probably familiar with includes. I'm from Texas now, so I can say y'all. Um, in include, you know, you can create functions or function libraries. And let's start off with the basics, basics first. You can download a library, and this will happen with a lot of people. They'll, they'll say like, hey, I, I got your script, and it, it says I'm missing a function, right? And it's like, well, you need to use an include, point to that file. Now, if you point an auto hotkey, and I think it's one of three places the LIB folder under where AutoHotKey is currently installed, the under my documents for AutoHotKey, there's an LIB folder. And then there's one other one. Jackie, do you remember where that is? Where AutoHotKey is stored. Oh, the current script. Sorry, the current script where you are, the LIB folder under there. Yeah, no, the, I mentioned the where AutoHotKey, the current, the executable one. Yeah. Um, that's the one I by default use. So it's always in my mind. But the script folder that you're in, an LIB folder there, Auto Hockey will automatically search those locations, you know, for you. But if you don't put the name of that, and this is where it gets a little more complex. Um, like I built an Excel function library. And what I did was I created, now if your function is just one, function that sounded terrible if your file is just one function you can name it that function and put it in the in the folder and it will find it but what if you have a bunch of related stuff like my excel you know what let me share my screen and i'll pull it up um where's the screen because this to me is one of the really great things i'm gonna share all right am i sharing this main screen did it, did it come up Jackie seems frozen. Oh no, nope, you're there. Jackie. No, no, I'm not frozen. No, I was reading, but yeah, now I'm I'm really seeing your screen. Yeah. Okay. So this Excel function, I have a lot of functions in here. Notice how every function in here begins with this Excel underscore, right? Excel underscore, Excel underscore. And the name of my library file is Excel, right? And What's cool about this is AutoHotKey will automatically, you know, um, it basically looks for anything that begins with the XL up until the first underscore. Isn't that right, Jackie? The, and then everything in it can be leveraged. Um, so I can point to this uh, uh, file using an include and, or even have it in my library into those places I mentioned, and it'll automatically find the files for you. So you, I can have all of them in one file is the point instead of having multiple files. Yeah. Depending on whatever you like most, we've seen lots of discussions of is it best to have all of it in one file or is it better to have multiple files? Is it better to have one main script or having multiple scripts? And I do not believe that one is truly better than the other. It comes down to preference. Maybe if your script becomes amazingly large, it could become an issue, but other than that, yeah. Yeah, and um, I like to, I like to think about the stuff and grouping it together, like my Excel stuff, clearly it's all related to Excel. And so I'm like, you know, I'd rather have that all in one file and just put that in my library and then they're grouped together. And so I know right where to go. And it's very easy to find. And, and also I don't have, um, I, don't, I don't actually know how many functions are in here. I know there's a simple way to get a count somehow, but um, there's there's quite a few in here. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a very convenient way to store them. Uh, like the GDI library, right? That's two or 3,000 lines long, if I remember right. Uh, and, and that would be a mess trying to keep those all separate. And functions have parameters that are functions. If no, I it, I don't believe so. I've, 
that's just off the top of my head. But if it can't have objects as default parameters, that sounds weird. He, he, uh, you said he thinks they can. I'm not to cut you off, Jackie, but um, I, I know so, he knows his stuff. So yeah, uh, yeah, and it's fine. I was also saying bound function as an argument. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, a I don't... function can have a parameter as a function. As you mean all parameter? Calling, a, yeah, calling. You can definitely call one as yeah, a parameter. Yeah, I, right? of course yeah. you can pass yeah, the value of right. a function in as a but, parameter. I totally get that, but yeah, but as but not itself, defining a function. Yeah, yeah. What were you say, Chunji? Um, I was saying it can be a bound function. You can also just put like a string of the function name and then, you know, the function just knows to call that. So short answer, yes. Long answer. Yes. Cool. Was there any other... Um... Thanks for hanging out, Marche. I think yeah. I'm saying your name correct if I remember right. Um, yeah, awesome. Was there any other? And I know we covered a lot. Functions really are, they, they, they really level you up. Um, it's hard to explain. And, and if you like, we can pick something that has a Go sub and show how to adapt it into using a function. Because what I would need is an example. If anyone has one using a Go sub, Geek dude is is posting an example in the chat chat of actually having a custom function that is passed a function, and that function is then dynamically called. Okay, fair enough. Um, can probably be done, but yeah, off the top of my head, I didn't see those ways of doing it as viable when Dale asked. But yeah. Can yeah, and Dale asked, which is actually, um, it's, a, it's a really good question, is can function be recursive? And it's absolutely, uh, Jean led a webinar on recursion using functions. And it's it's one of the incredibly crazy powerful things to do, right? Is to be able, recursion means you call itself, right? It, it'll call itself until something happens. Um, hopefully you build something in there to stop it. But it can keep calling itself and doing stuff. And the concept is really, one of the, the most powerful things I think in programming is you start realizing some of these, you need that capability, right? To have it where it can keep going, drilling down and down and down until it runs, until some sort of a logical end happens. And it was the, like- uh, Auto hack, he has a limit of recursion. I think it's like, I forget if it's 2000 or 200. Hmm. But you'll get a recursion limit exceeded error. That's probably good though, right? Yeah. Because- yeah, I mean, it could be bad if you don't have it break. Yeah. Um, but did anybody, and, and if no one has any questions on this, does anyone have anything else that they want to help with? Or I know Dimitri's, I see Dimitri here. He had, he does some really cool stuff with uh, styles, colored uh, styles in, uh, in the GUI stuff. Um, I can demonstrate it if nobody else needs any help. Sure. I said go ahead and tell, yeah. I mean, you can go ahead and start because let's just not, you know, spend an hour on it, but um, go ahead and get into it. Because to me, you, you gave me a little demo this last Friday during the live support stuff. And uh, I, I was really, uh, I always said blown away, but it was like, it was very cool how simple it was to give some extra life to new GUI, to, sorry, the old GUIs. Yeah, that's true, because when you try to change the style of your GUIs, it's not that easy in AutoHotKey. You need to know a few tricks of it. Uh, actually, I, I am working currently on, a, on a, an other... I can quickly demonstrate it. And this is also a kind of a nice uh, setting GUI. It looks a lot like the Windows 10 setting. 
and it also indicates uh, when you hover over the buttons then uh, you see some uh, rectangles moving and you can click it so uh, I also like this style and it's actually kind of funny uh, story um, I made the DLL calls to create those re rectangles and then I posted it on the forum and then uh, one guy told me yeah I use uh, text with uh, 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 no text in it and just a background for to create that and I was like of course <laughs> You know what, Dimitri, and that's also one of the whole things of why we should either talk to other people or share iCode because, you know, other people do stuff and you're like, you know, you could have just done it this way. And you're like, oh, oh yeah, you know, it's it's always great to have someone point out something where you're like, yeah, awesome. And then the, I, I tried really hard to create those rectangles with the, I think I needed four DLL calls and it worked and not that perfect it had some glitches but it was acceptable and then uh, yeah right just, but my other script that i wanted to demonstrate uh, for those who don't know it i was working on a on a copy of notepad with all uh, the functions inside it as an exercise also with the the GUIs to to replace and things like that and uh, then we wanted to apply a skin on it so that you don't do not need to set everything uh, the color and i have uh, i will run the same uh, uh, script but just with one extra line in it this is a function that uh, actually uh, calls a dll uh, i think it uses here uh, uskin dll and also a, a file called MSS styles, and this defines a, a skin for the GUI. Uh, also, one important thing that I just uh, learned: you need to uh, run it with uh, AutoHotkey uh, 32. That was a, a mistake that I made in in the last. Uh, but in to, to clarify something you just said, Dimitri. You do because the script you wrote to recreate Notepad is um, written in uh, version two, right? But you can run um, the you can use your styles approach with the regular version of AutoHotkey with the thirty two bit version as well, right? Um, just yeah. want to clarify, it doesn't have to be version two. It's your program's written in that, and that's why. That's true. That's true. And as a result, you get something like this. So it's uh, a dark theme. You see a few glitches, like for example, the status bar hasn't changed color. Uh, I haven't looked into it, but maybe you can kind of easy change the color. But uh, I also have a setting to, to hide it, so uh, it's nicer. Um, also, the other um, GUIs are also looking nice. Uh, <laughs> always on live demonstration oh there we go see now to yeah. me like uh, that got me really excited just because we all know that normal auto hockey GUIs just look so dated and this to me just suddenly breathes a little extra life into them yeah so yeah but for me, it was just an exercise to see what I could do with the GUIs. And also, uh, I'm currently really hard trying to learn uh, the advantages of the second version. And uh, yeah, those are nice uh, exercises. And another glitch that you see is, for example, that uh, the menus are in change of color, but that's something that we can easily change. I'm not sure if it's easy to change the the text color. Mm. I know that you can change the background color. Yeah. But yeah, that's interesting to know that it's quite easy with uh, those files. But I find them that they are quite rare and they're actually uh, from origin. I think it was something of Windows XP. So 
it, I find a few of them, but they don't those are, don't everything works kind of well. So uh, yeah, but and... interesting method, uh, and I yeah. was searching for uh, something that uh, could switch it to the dark mode of uh, of uh, Windows because I kind of like it, but uh, it's hard to uh, to copy it to Arcus. Yeah, and just could you mentioned this to me as well that you scan DLL and your other file, those aren't native on our computers, right? So you have to go get those. Yes, indeed. Um, you can find them on the forum. Uh, actually, also, I just copied this uh, also from the forum and I tried to implement it to uh, the version two and also to try to collect more styles and, and see uh, how to demonstrate it. But uh, it's an interesting tech, uh, technique, yeah. And it saves you a lot of uh, hassles to, uh, to, else you need to almost create for every uh, uh, control, you need to create your custom control and it's, yeah, not e that easy. Yeah, Jackie, do you, I mean, do you look at this? Does this, do you kind of breathe a little new life into the, older looking GUIs. Yeah, I do like um, that that you are able to change it without doing it manually for every type of thing. Of course, I don't know how much activity lies behind this new skin here, but as the menus still don't look like it, you had to hide the status bar and stuff like that. Um, it still seems like you do need to do quite a bit of extra work to get the style you wish for. Which is fine, but yeah, it's great to actually have the option. A, a simple, really somewhat simple, um, once we wrap it with something uh, to, to make it wear. Because I, I know it's just... When you see the normal version of it, they just look so dated. And this to me was like, you know, it. it I know it's just lipstick, but lipstick works. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the interesting part would be uh, the ability to just flip on the other style. Yeah, yeah, you can really flip it on and off. That's that's possible. But as you you also said. Uh, Apparently, status bar isn't updated, and also the menus. And one other thing I noticed, for example, here you have a white line beneath it. That's kind of strange. And also the fact that sometimes they use white as a background. Well, Dimitri, did did you play? I'm just curious, especially your concave.msstyles styles like file. It, what I'm curious is, perhaps there's a different ms styles file where it actually does update some of these things maybe it's just that file that didn't set those parameters you know do we do we know for sure that um it's not actually available then i will use uh Eki also mentions in the chat here a quick plug for neutron <laughs> the one yeah. he showed us before where you can actually build your uh, guis using html uh, which also looks very nice. But yeah, it, it's still quite involved uh, or in involved. Yeah. Um, if maybe there was, I don't know, a builder or something, uh, drag and drop out of hotkey elements with style settings, something like that, that might help more people adopt something like that. Do you, yeah. do you have a link to your Neutron, either GitHub or forum link handy? I mean, I can find it, but... Sorry. Uh, oh, so what do you got here? Yeah, this is just another uh, style. I, I actually made a... Uh, this is my example, and it's just an example to, to see what the different styles gives. Uh, the only disadvantage is when I click it, it moves to the other window. <laughs> Okay, this also has quite a few visual uh, defects from how it looks on my end, at least. Yes, 
actually the one that I used uh, at the start, I found that one of the the nicest one. So indeed, this is one minimalistic. It sees that's also interesting to to see. But they're indeed quite old, and I'm kind of surprised that we don't have an easy way to to switch to the dark mode uh, of Windows Ten. That would be a nice feature uh, to add to the, the GUI uh, object. I think I I don't know because I've never really looked into it, but I'm guessing that the code or the functions that are a hotkey actually accesses to build the GUIs is probably uh, what to call that like legacy or something like that. It's, it's not really up to par with how Windows makes windows and menus and stuff like that today. Yeah, that could be very well be true. They probably predate uh, dark mode. Yeah, that's possible. But yeah, on the other hand, if you need something functional, this works. So I understand that. And I also uh, heard of Neutron, but I find it kind of, uh, uh, how do you say it in English? Um, uh, yeah, you need to learn it all again. And this is quite interesting because just with one line, you change everything and you just can use the default uh, GUI commands. Which actually, Dimitri, that, that was one of the things I was going to say when Jackie mentioned it is, you know, you could, let's say you created a, a, a tool, a GUI for a client, and they, you know, they mentioned they're just not happy, blah, blah, blah. This is something you can switch in seconds or maybe a couple minutes, and they could suddenly be like, wow, hey, you know what? Yeah, it looks a lot better. I like it now. You know, I mean, it's a simple thing to try, right? Yeah, that's true. I hear it's also kind of a nice... Uh... Oh, that is nice. Yeah. And the advantage of this one, uh, I assume that the, the status bar and the menus aren't changed. But uh, in this example, it wouldn't matter much because the colors are a little bit the same. It, and then um, about two weeks ago, I had a call with Hellbent, and we, we walked through his button he called it button creator but it was really more like a theme creator and you could create like a look of buttons and and you know then apply that theme to other buttons his button class and it was it was amazing honestly like i, I should try to get him to come on sometime for a webinar and to talk through because uh it was it was very powerful and I'll, I'll put the link to the video that we did in the you know the the post and stuff because it was it's was very powerful He's using the GDI library for creating images and drawing them. The great thing about it was he's literally drawing all the buttons and everything. So the DPI issues just go away because you don't have to worry about it. I did I did an, an example once, once upon a time, where I built the entire GUI with GDI plus as well. And but that becomes bothersome, just like many other types of, of code where you have to program everything yourself, even though you do it with classes and stuff like that. Because there is so much functionality that people actually do want to do. So it's 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 a quite well, a lot of work to actually yeah, and, cover. And Jackie, that was where um because Hellband already had a class for after you create the button, then it's like, oh, if you mouse over it, it you know, or if you click it, it has all that built into it. So it made it really easy because it was kind of like the whole thing. Fine text on itself was great, but when you found the thing, you, then you had to figure, you know, for non-coders, they had to figure out how do I move my mouse or how do I click and do whatever. And I'm like, that's why I wrote automate more. Well, Maestri wrote for me, automate my task, which builds into that other functionality because finding it's just part of the thing. Then you got to react with it, right? And um, yeah, it's, but it's, I'm I'm guessing that help and he stopped that buttons for a reason. I think he's still working on stuff, but yeah. Yeah, but yeah, you, you have so many other types of controls for GUIs. Fair enough, like, right. Drop downs yeah. or whatnot, right, yeah. Multi-boxes, uh, 
you know, selection trees and right. yeah, just goes on and on. Yeah, sorry. That's true. Um, in V2, you also have an interesting class. I think I showed it before that uh, really uh, adds uh, methods to the, the GUI that you can use. For example, to add a, a button with a, an image and things like that. And uh, I think it will be expanded in the future. And that's also quite nice that you have, you just add new methods with the same style of uh, the native auto hotkey commands. So then the learning curve isn't that high. Yeah. Hey, Dimitri. Yeah. Jean, Jean had asked, which <laughs> we, it, it's all the, uh, it, I totally ambushed Dimitri. He, he comes on to the live session last Friday and he's demonstrating all this cool stuff. And then he, he demonstrated this, the, this beautiful coloring stuff. The, and then he showed his notepad and I'm like, Hey, what'd be really cool is if you combine the two. And then of course, as doing things live, it broke. And later you found out it was because you had to be using the 32 bit version of version, you know, of the auto hotkey to be doing this. But Jean was asking to clarify, why is it tied to the 32 bit? I actually, I'm, a, I'm an amateur. I'm an amateur programmer, but I suspect that it has something to do with the DLL uh, uh, functions. Yeah, That's that, it, I guess. The, um, I forget what that DLL was that you were referencing, but that one could be limited to 30, well, yeah. See, that's what I don't understand. I can understand how if it was reversed, if it was, you had to be 64 bit and you can't use 32 bit to access that, that I could conceptually understand that, but I don't understand the other way. Jackie, do you have any idea? Of what? I, I didn't catch it when we actually had um, how you used the Dell to have that code. I can show it. Uh... It's a perfect example. What Dimitri did was he he did was what I mentioned in the, the beginning of the webinar. You can wrap something very complicated in something that looks simple and you don't have to make it all messy in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> so here you're utilizing, you're initializing the U skin with the Dell call they're online, what, 687? And you don't do anything else with the, the Dell after that? Uh, no, you just yeah. use this function. And actually, I think in the example, they also, afterwards, they, uh, they uh, exited, but I was kind of dirty and just didn't do it, and it still worked. <laughs> Yeah, okay. but I'm I'm guessing that then it is the Dell. It's probably uh, compiled in 32-bit. It probably again predates 64-bit systems. Who knows? Yeah, and I'm kind of wondering if if in, there aren't other ways to do it because I think there's also on the forum they talk about another GL call that they they use. Uh, so there are multiple ways to, to apply skins, I think. But that yeah, one, that was version, um, also with some advertising in it. So I, I prefer not to use it. Yeah. But you skin, uh, with the code or we are using for our hotkey skins or GUIs. Because they are the hotkey GUIs, ours are all there from what their first use was in 2004. Um, and they worked all the way down to Windows 98 or something, I don't remember. Um, U-skin and the way it reskins our hotkeys GUIs is probably pretty old as well. And Therefore, my guess would be it's limited to 32-bit as it has never been converted to 64-bit yeah. itself. Well, and I think this is still on, on the same topic, but you know, 
I was going to try to find it because I have it somewhere, but the, uh, the Windows Spy tool, not not the auto built-in auto hotkey one, but the one that shows you, you know, the controls, this and that. Um, didn't it also show you something to do with styles? Isn't that something? Is that is that the same style that we're talking about? Does that sound right? It might be. It depends on how you style actually does their thing, but it, they're probably just using Windows styles to tell all the controls how to look. I, I do not think that's, that's the same. Doesn't that, you, you can also do a command, a win get style and win get x style of a yeah. control. And I think that that's more something to do with the, the style options that you set. Those are the, the codes. Yeah, but that's that's what you actually do have on many of your things, right? You have rounded corners or you have different backgrounds and text colors. Those are styles. So this is the um, Windows Spy tool I was talking about. And here are styles list styles and extended styles. Oh. Um, and I dropped it on the studio is Jackie, is that? This is where I have no idea. I've never looked at other than seeing them going styles. Well, I don't know what that is. I don't really care. <laughs> I I know that you can restyle stuff. You can give it a smaller or wider border, or you can make sure the text is bold and stuff like that. And you can use styles for that. And I'm just not sure if you style the yep. Dell is utilizing these styles. And yep. as Dimitri said, he wasn't. He was pretty convinced they weren't but again how would they then do it because then they would need to somehow hook into all of what windows is doing and change the graphics of the stuff and so my belief would be that they're utilizing stuff that's already built into windows and just reframing the styles on this stuff Oh, thank you. Yeah, sorry. I just, I've always wondered. I'd seen these, and I'm like, I just don't even. I understood, like I said, I kind of googled it once and saw there are styles that you can change. And I looked at the code. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to dive into it now. I think you can uh, add them as an option to, if you say plus, and then the uh, I, maybe you need to set style and then the number, and then the yeah, style. Maybe. It's the way the styles work. They're a hexadecimal number. And if you add, let's say, 10 to the already existing number, all of these would accumulate to a higher, unique hexadecimal number. So you can add all of these together and have all of the styles in one. And that would be a unique number. And if you remove the single one, you would have a new unique number. So that's how uh, styles and hexadecimal numbers in this case work. So if you have uh, the Diagel model frame here, that would be a one, but you also have the no parent notify, which is a four. If you add those two together, you would have a five and it would know it had both of those styles. It has if to. you had the right. topmost and the DL model frame, you would have a nine. You can't make a nine in any other way. So again, Windows would know you had those two styles. And that's how building styles in this case works. By adding the numbers together, Windows knows that this unique number adds up to having these different styles. And what's the difference between styles and extended styles? Extended styles is just because originally they only had the first styles. Then they figured out hmm, people want to do more extended styles. Okay. And then the extra crispy styles are next. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That's... Very interesting. But if they can or can't do exactly what new styles do, I'm not sure. I've not used them enough to know. John gave us the link here for the, the styles. Um, and, and in my head, in case you don't understand the hexadecimal thing, but message boxes work kind of the same way where you can, you know, add a couple different numbers, but 
it always adds to something unique, right? And and that's how it knows what to display. So anyway, that this is this has been a really interesting. Um, yeah, I don't work with GUIs a lot, but um, which is also what really appealed to me, Dimitri, with uh, what you've done, or you know what someone else, everyone done with the, the styles is a very simple approach to breathe some new lives into you know some sort of GUIs without taking twenty hours to to rewrite something. You know, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Does That's anyone else have any other either questions on this or on something else? Well, Dimitri share his code for the webinar notes. Um, Dimitri, you have a post on the webinar on the sorry on the forum somewhere, correct? If I remember right. Yes. Uh, uh, if you search for my uh, webinar name, uh, my uh, forum name, that's ahk underscore user. And you you will find my latest post will be on uh, about. What was uh, your, sorry, what's your username? A H A H K underscore user. Oh, okay. Like that? No, no, A H K. Oh, A H K. Okay. The extension of auto hot k underscore user. I kept it quite general. <laughs> ah, gotcha. Okay. And then uh styles. I, I I don't know I haven't applied that for styles. I don't know if I posted it. I thought you did, because I I thought you mentioned it in a in our call Saturday, you gave me, or Friday, you gave me something. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, anyway, if you can, um, at some point, send me what you did, um, or, you know, I'll either post it on the automator or I'll find the link and um, we'll get it in the resources when we share, uh, share everything out. Yeah, someone just asked if you can post the link. Hey, well, we'll, we'll find it and, and, Either share it or I'll send it out in the email, which everyone on this thing is, should have. Yeah, I'll call that actually a special extension. Uh, if you want to to upload it or, or send it in the mail, sometimes uh, the internet will try to uh, prevent that because it could be uh, something hazardous. So okay. you. you send it easily with a mail. Sorry, what? For example, if you made it executable and you try to send oh, sure. it to somebody, then uh, most of the email servers will try to warn you or make it difficult for you because uh, it could be a virus. And sure. also the email alcohol, I had the same issue. Yeah, I uh, I typically, you know, even I just use Dropbox and send people a link. It's just so much easier. Yeah. But apparently on, uh, I think I have a, a forum post, a scanning GUI in 64-bit, uh, where I question about if somebody knows it. And uh, there's also a link to another post that has a demonstration and also the links to the uScan for DLL. I'll post it there. Uh. Oh, well, yeah, thank you. thanks again, Dimitri. I, like I said, I think this is awesome. Oh, good. I actually have a small question. I'm not sure if somebody has experience in it, but uh, currently I'm trying to work a lot with the Visual Studio code, but I didn't manage to uh, actually hint information from it. Does somebody has some experience in it? Does anybody here have experience with that? Uh, I've used it, but so it's Isaiah's, you know, really Raptor X got into it. Um, and so I didn't, he used it on my computer is a better way to put it. Um, so I'm not very familiar with it. Yeah, I, 
I'm missing a functionality to just press F1 and find the function help. Uh, but I think it's actually written with something. It's I think it has something to do with Chrome uh, that it's written uh, with a, a Chrome engine. But yeah, it's not that important. Yeah, um, I'm trying to remember. I know um, both Tank and Maestrith are using Visual Studio now, so I can ask either of them. Yeah. They're not on the call at the moment. And of course, uh, the the editor has also a lot of extensions, but uh, it's not that easy to to set it up. <laughs> it's amazing what it can do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought the webinar we did, where Isaiah showed us using Visual Studio and its integration with GitHub, was just awesome, right? Yeah. And again, if I worked with other people and, and needed to sync files a lot working with them i would definitely be using it but i don't just don't do it so i don't okay any other questions or um anything we can help with um actually i was experimenting a little bit with uh the on matches message functions also with the mouse move uh, uh, command of it. And um, I actually wanted to try to make a button that um, um, sometimes nowadays you sometimes have text and it's actually a button. And if you hover over on it, it uh, you get a background color on it. So I managed to do that. Uh, but it was kind of strange. You need to, apparently, you need to add uh, events to the control so that the uh, all message will be registered, so that it will detect it. I can demonstrate it. Sure. So uh, here I've made a, a mouse move. Wait, am I sharing? No, I'm not sharing. No, and and for those of you, you know, on messages, um, it's a great way to or using messages within auto well Windows. It's a really, really it, that's a little advanced, uh, a little tricky, but um, really incredibly powerful way to be able to connect to programs and automate them or see what's going on. Uh, I think control uh, text and then I add Uber equals let's call it the yellow. Um, and here I check. If the current control has a property hover and then I change the option. To uh, control of actually what I have done now, I quickly done it. Um, here I made. I made a text. Yeah, with a, a specified background that it's red. And I tell it it has also a proper, it, it's actually an object in version two. That's very useful. And then I gave it a new property, it's called hover. And the hover is called yellow. Okay. 
And then if I go to the move functionality, then here I check if the current control where it hovered over is if it has a property hover. And if it has it, then I change the background to that uh, value. So we'll, we'll try to run it. Um, try to get the error message. Current control. Ah, yeah. That's kind of annoying. If I select something, then he will try to. And uh, where is the text? Ah, okay, I just, I made a small mistake. No pressure. <laughs> so I've, I've put it in the text and not ah, in the yeah. text. Yeah. Okay, mistake. So now you see that uh, it has a background, and of course you can uh, change uh, the size of it uh, with the width and the height and put it center, so that's not a problem. But if I move the mouse, uh, uh, the mouse move is actually not triggered. It doesn't detect it. But if I move the mouse here on the left, then you see uh, that there is a small rectangle it's maybe difficult to see uh, that is changing. Oh, yeah, I barely see it. it. Took me a second, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. But that's because text isn't broadcasting that you're moving your mouse over. There's no interaction for you with text, so there's no reason for it to broadcast mm -hmm. that there's a mouse move on it. Yes. Yeah. But if you add an uh, event on it, ah, yeah, um, that's al also maybe something that's confusing for people who do not know the version 2. In version 2, you can put events on controls. So now I put, put an event on the control. If uh, you click on it, you will activate a button OK. And now, uh, no, it's still not changing. Uh, maybe if I put a, a name to it, that could maybe work. <clears throat> no. Um, I managed to, to work it, but. I tried it today and I managed to work it, but I think I forgot how to do it. <laughs> That's right. uh, how could you could you manage it, Jackie? Do you have an idea? It's way too far back when I actually tried to do stuff like this, mm -hmm. um, so I I don't remember uh, what you might need to do to actually get the hover registered. I, I managed to do it, but I forgot how to do it. Yeah. And actually, it was working quite well, but then I had the difficulty that if you were over out of it, it should also change color. And <laughs> then, uh, then it becomes uh, more difficult. <laughs> Or, or I could uh, add a timer to it that checks if it's still on it and afterwards uh, change the color that's also. Um, but yeah, it was just me playing around because I prefer actually to uh, to use the... Um, if you just make something that works uh, as a function that you just go once and set everything uh, and you do not need to get, take care of anything else that's way easier yeah so i prefer to find solutions like that yeah. uh, another uh, cool trick that i uh, 
then that was if you move the GUI that everything changes with it. And I actually added uh, to this control, I added also properties like uh, the left margin is 10 and the bottom margin is 40. And then in my uh, function that is called when the GUI changes size, then I check if it has those uh, properties. And if it has those, then we will calculate uh, the, the new size of it and we will move it. And that's also something that is quite powerful uh, to be used because I just uh, put this function inside and then I can just, for every control, I can define it and it, they will change along with it. I, I like it because you just need to put this function in it and then you can, you're quite flexible to, to change the way how your GUI is working. I really like the way uh, oh. Virtual is handling uh, GUIs. That's way easier than the, the first one. Now, and Dimitri, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but um, it was something that, you know, we, we did, a, you, you led the webinar on version two, yeah. two, two or three months ago, and it was very interesting stuff. But last Friday, you mentioned the, um, the requires directive, which actually I, I didn't even know existed. And I'm like, hey, that's a good one since we got the webinar people here. Let, why don't you show that real quickly just to say <clears throat> it's good to have in your script because you can force the version so people realize they don't spend too much time you know, with something that's not going to work. Yeah, actually, uh, this is something that I start putting on every script that I have um, because uh, I actually do not like the, the one thing that uh, Lexicos has done, and that is not to change the extension of the next version, because uh, now you, a lot of people have uh, version 1 and version 2 on their computer, because they have old, useful version 1 scripts, and they also have version, starts using version 2, and it's uh, hard to, to, to keep track of them. But actually, uh, both versions have, have a, a command here, a hashtag requires, and then you put uh, the, the version of the auto key, auto hotkey uh, that, is, that is necessary to run it. So you can put a lower version in it, uh, and if you will try to, to run it with uh, an even lower function, uh, a version, then we will give you automatically an error that indicates you're using the wrong version. Also, the thing with version 1 and version 2, it will also detect it. Um, but if you're mixing it up, I prefer actually to, to use uh, new extensions like uh, AHA1 and AHA2 to make it very, very clear uh, which, uh, which program you, uh, you want to use. And I would advise everybody who is mixing those up. Yeah, it's a wise, a good decision to, to put it on top of your script. And also, if you start posting on the forum, I also try to, to add it always uh, to prevent uh, confusing people. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> cool. Well, does anybody else have anything that any <clears throat> anything you're stuck on and want help with or want to show off? If not, I guess we're good. Oh, do you have the function on message in your code? Um, oh, he does. Yes, of course. Else it wouldn't work. Uh, actually, one thing that I found interesting that um, if you create a GUI inside a function and you put the on message function inside that function, uh, then it will only trigger on the GUI and not on other uh, windows. It's on other on other other hotkey windows from that same script. 
Uh, yes, yes, it will be specific for. I think so. Because think... on message doesn't work for win for other windows than other hotkeys. It only works for its own process. Um, I thought that it would be specified to uh, that win that query that was in created, but actually. Um, Version two has something like nested functions, so uh, those will be all can only be used if you put a function inside a function uh, at the bottom of it. Uh, then you can only use that function inside that function. Yeah, so because there is a new kind of scope inside functions, yes. which is fine because in one you couldn't define a function inside a function, so. Yeah, but, and that's yeah. very useful to create the uh, GUIs because I actually try to make two versions of my uh, Notepad script. One that uh, was based on uh, creating a function with nested functions, and that worked really good. And the other one, I tried to uh, use a class, but mm -hmm. I found that very complicated. It was, yeah, it was very hard to do so if somebody wants to do it i i advise just use functions with nested functions and that's the easiest way to do it uh, i have a nice example on the on the forum uh, i think it's it's indeed my my notepad uh, uh, script as you can find it on the forum and you can also find my ex, uh, my tryout to use a class for it but it's uh, uh, way more complicated and you you get a lot of uh, difficulty parts that you need to uh, handle. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you all for joining us. Hopefully you, um, you know, learned a little bit. And if you're not using functions, trust me, learning them is the best thing you could, you know, really levels you up very quickly. Uh, and uh, hope, oh, ne so next month will be the last webinar we have on this same link. And then um, I'm going to have to create a whole new invite. Uh, it'll, I'm sure I'll talk to Jackie, but I doubt we'll change any time or anything, dates. But um, yeah, we need to send out a new invite. But uh, thank you all for being here. Yeah, Adri, thank you for jumping in and sharing your stuff. That's very cool. Okay. Great. Have a nice uh, afternoon and uh, sleep well for the Europeans. Yeah, thank you. Everyone, thank you. Bye. Bye.